Right, well, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, I hear you yep. loud. All right, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak at this meeting. Um, um, I'm going to uh, share my screen, I hope. I hope that's worked. Um, yeah, that's you. Right. So what I'm going to talk about, it's going to be a sort of a rather rapid traversal of a number of areas. Um, and I'm going to firstly talk about what is coercion, then about the troubling epidemiology of coercion, which I hope will trouble you as much as it troubles me. And then the question is coercion effective or necessary? Uh, and then something a little bit about reducing recourse to coercive interventions. Um, a look at the international momentum to minimize the use of coercion and a suggestion for attendees at this meeting for something that they can do. And uh, I'll come to that at the very end. So what is coercion? Well, uh, I think a useful way of thinking about coercion is in terms of a spectrum of treatment pressures. People use coercion in very different ways. I'm sticking to uh, a, a, an approach which is based on the work of a philosopher of law and which I think a number of people accept as a reasonable um, way of thinking about coercion. So what I've shown in the slide is, is a hierarchy of treatment pressures which become more and more serious as one progresses from one to five. So persuasion is fairly straightforward, it's an appeal to reason. So I'm now talking about a patient who is reluctant or refusing or unwilling to take, to have the treatment that's proposed medication, for example. So persuasion is a discussion of the pros and cons and uh, an appeal to reason. Interpersonal leverage then is a little more complex and that is a patient may agree to treatment that they don't really want to have because they want to please the mental health professional who has been extremely helpful and kind to them in the past. And then we move on to inducements and I'm going to consider inducements and threats together because both of them involve a particular kind of proposition, an if-then proposition. So the if-then is, if, if you do A, I will do X. If you don't do A, I will do Y. And the crux of the distinction between threats and offers, and this is from Wertheimer, the philosopher I mentioned, is that inducements don't uh, uh, don't amount to threats. And the crux of the difference between a threat and an inducement is what happens if B doesn't accept A's proposal? So what if the patient doesn't accept the proposal of the psychiatrist or the mental health professional? A threat means that a non-acceptance makes the person, the patient, puts the person in, in a worse off position than a relevant baseline position, which is usually taken to be a moral baseline position. So that, you know, if you don't take the medication, I'm going to uh, initiate a process for bringing you into hospital against your will. Um, now, one usually um, is, is entitled to liberty and not to be admitted involuntarily to, to a hospital. Um, now, that's not to say that there may not be um, justifications for acting in this way, but you know, for, for conceptually, a person who refuses a threat is in a worse off position than if the threat had not been made. Whereas an offer, for example, I'll give you £15 for each uh, intramuscular injection you have, long-acting... Uh, antipsychotic um, and uh, you know you're not really happy about taking it but I'm going to make you this uh, offer of 15 pounds each time and here obviously if, if the patient says no I don't want it they're they're no worse off than if the offer had never been made 
I mean, there's a problem about the baseline. I'm considering a moral baseline. I can't really go into too much detail about this in the time that's available. And so if we go back to that hierarchy, it's threats and compulsory treatment that amount to coercion. I hope that's clear. Um, now, inducements, just very briefly, uh, in, in the world outside the realm of medicine, especially mental health care, inducements are obviously less coercive than a threat. You know, for example, when a bank offers a low interest rate, if you switch to that bank, then that's an inducement. If you don't want it, well, you, you, you lose nothing. Whereas if the bank said, well, look, if you don't accept uh, switching to our bank, we're going to initiate a credit investigation into you and we're going to make sure that all other um, banks and other financial uh, bodies have this information. And that, that's fairly clear, but I have become uh, rather against a place for inducements in mental health care because of uh, the main reason is that there is a problem of commensurability of values or commodification. If you put a financial incentive to take treatment on, it, it's like saying, oh, I've got a baby that I don't want. How much are you going to offer me for the baby? The metric that's being used, that is money on the one hand and treatment or a baby at the other hand, there is an incommensurability. Those values, the value of money and the value of a human life or flourishing, human flourishing, cannot be measured on the same metric, money. Secondly, there's a question of fairness. I mean, why should somebody be offered an inducement and the, and the more prudent patients not receive the indu inducement? And also, why would a patient who is rather hard up say that they, they will accept the medication if they know if they say no, they'll get some, some payment? So that's very briefly. I'm inclined to think that inducements don't have a place now in uh, mental health care. And just a, a brief point that there is both objective coercion, uh, which I think is helpful in thinking about ethical issues and interventions at various levels in, in, in research, but also the subjective um, coercion, and that is the perceived uh, coercion that a person feels. And, and this is clinically extremely important. Just briefly, when we think about the regulation of coercion, we can see that compulsion is regulated in, in mental health acts, usually based on, uh, on status of disorder and risk, uh, but Northern Ireland, of course, is, is world leading in, in having now passed a different regime, a non-discriminatory regime. But other forms of pressure, although common in practice and certainly threats, are not regulated, it's one of the problems with threats, nor are there guidelines, except maybe for threats where the code of practice prohibits uh, threats, despite the fact that 50% of voluntary patients, roughly in different studies, will say that they have been subject to threats and that's why they're in hospital. Perhaps community care has increased the frequency of coercive interventions, risk is defined in a different way. Um, and there is the problem of the ever-present coercive backdrop in psychiatry, which is something that I don't think that we clinicians appreciate, and it's, it's, it's something that society sees as a necessary element of psychiatry. Uh, and that finally, the, to say that we need an ethical framework for coercive interventions and other treatment pressures. So although compulsion is regulated, I think we need a framework that works across the whole range of treatment pressures. I mean, for example, deciding whether to do a home visit on a, for a patient who's saying, I don't want you to come under any circumstances. Uh, we need a framework that deals with that as well as dealing with uh, straightforward compulsion. Now, the extraordinary variation in the frequency of the use of, of coercion in psychiatry. 
This is, uh, this deals with 2013, and this is the rate of involuntary hospitalizations in a number of European countries in 2013, that's per 100,000 population. Look at that variation between Italy and Austria as is roughly an 18 fold difference, 18 fold difference. Italy and England is uh, six fold roughly uh, difference. These are huge differences. And look at the differences. This is a Norwegian study. These are the use of seclusion strengths and involuntary medication on wards, only considering involuntary admitted patients. And you can see the huge variation. It's a bit, a bit small, but the purple is the use of seclusion. Huge variation in the use of seclusion and huge variation, sorry, in the use of uh, involuntary medication, which is the, the light blue. And then we have international variation in the kinds of coercion. So here I'm comparing Sweden and the UK, where Sweden uses much more per 100,000 uh, and also mechanical restraints, which are not used in the UK. And they don't use physical restraints or, or holding, um, which is much more commonly used in, in, in the UK. So again, huge variations. And then variation over time, and this is uh, changes in involuntary admission. So it's just detentions, admissions um, between 1964 and 2014. And you can see this steep increase. Um, the decade between uh, uh, 84 and, uh, sorry, between 94 and 2014, is you can see is about a 50% uh, increase. And you can see the, this, this plateau area between 98 and 2008. And that interestingly corresponds to a period under labor of the huge investment in, in mental health. Remember there was a national service framework, uh, various teams were established, home treatment teams and so on. So it looks like resources do make a difference to the use of involuntary detentions. Um, this again shows uh, the, the light blue um, are detentions um, on admission to hospital and the, the bottom dark grey are detentions following admission and that's around 60, over 63,000 now in England. And Wales. And of course, uh, you'll be aware that there is a huge difference, fourfold difference in the rate of uh, involuntary admission by ethnic groups. And you can see that in the graph on the right, fourfold difference between black or black British and white. So is coercion effective or, or necessary? Well, there is an extraordinary, lamentable paucity of research interest in coercion. A review recently done by Gooding and, and others in Australia found only 42 studies that looked at coercion, the use of coercion as an outcome specifically. 42 over a period of God knows how many years there have been publications. Now, does involuntary admission to hospital work? Well, it's extraordinarily difficult to evaluate. There are huge ethical issues. And the answer, I think, is not to know. There are, there's the odd study that has randomized, this is in the United States, randomized patients who were deemed to require involuntary treatment, randomized them if they were not a danger to others to a community residential open door facility or to a, a, an acute ward, the quite old studies. And they didn't find a difference in, in outcomes and patients were more satisfied with the residential um, uh, option. So we don't know, we don't know how, how effective it is, but I'll come back in a moment to how necessary it is. CTOs, there that there have been uh, randomized controlled studies and they don't really support the effectiveness of CTOs. And certainly if you ask service users, patients and staff, they're not very keen on coercion. 
patients say it's humiliating, it undermines their, their self-confidence in their autonomy or agency, uh, their capacity for independence. They also, many will feel that having had an involuntary admission makes them more, more liable to further involuntary admissions. It damages trust in the mental health system and increases avoidance of uh, help seeking. I think there's evidence for all of those. Following involuntary admission one year later, 40% of patients interviewed in the study done in England uh, involving over a thousand, uh, around 1500 patients who, who were involuntarily admitted, for only 40% believed that compulsion was justified. There were many more patients who thought they needed some help, that they needed treatment, but it was the way in which it was delivered that was unacceptable. Now, I must say that 40% is probably quite a big overestimate because only 50% of eligible patients entered that study and only 50% of those who entered were followed up a year later. And I'm assuming that patients who are more satisfied with, with their admission were more likely to agree to be interviewed. Um, yes, this is an international study of, of, of uh, 11 countries. I'm not going to go into that. So there is this huge variation. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's huge scope for arbitrariness. And it indicates at least a gross overuse, at least in some places, an 18-fold difference. Now, OK, it's true that there are different uh, legal regimes which may affect the number of people who are admitted on, a, on, on an order. There are different service configurations, but an 18-fold difference or six-fold difference between uh, Italy and uh, England, uh, which have a, a similar number of, of beds and similar population, is, suggests that there is something more than just differences that can be explained in terms of uh, legislation or services. Now, one would expect then, if we have so few compulsory admissions in Italy, that there is going to be more suicides, presumably, of more people with mental illness are not being admitted involuntarily when, when in, in England that would be regarded that the, they did merit uh, such an admission. Or, or, or perhaps they end up in prison much more than in psychiatric hospital. And if there are more mentally ill people in prison, one would expect the prison suicide rate to be higher. So let's just focus on England and Italy here. And you can see the involuntary admission is much higher in England. Suicide rate, curiously, is lower in Italy. Now, there are differences in the way suicide is recorded in different countries, but clearly not a big difference there. Homicide rates, very, very similar. Incarceration rate is about 50% higher in England, but look at prison suicides, the same, except there are more prison suicides because the incarceration rate is 50% is higher. So this suggests to me that there is an unnecessary use of involuntary treatment in some places, England, for example, compared to Italy. Okay, so preventing and reducing coercion in mental health services. There's a, a, a large review done by Gooding et al, which I, I recommend you look at. So briefly, legal changes, yes, may have an effect in Italy, definitely the law of 180 uh, had a big effect in reducing involuntary admissions down to the low level in Switzerland by insisting that the only person who can uh, uh, authorize an involuntary admission has to be a trained psychiatrist that reduced the number of admissions by a substantial percentage. And in Germany, after a ruling of the uh, federal court, um, uh, mental health services were not allowed to use involuntary medication at all for eight months while this was sorted out between 2012 and 2013. And Martin Zinkler, a psychiatrist in Heidenheim, has, has given details about his uh, unit, which had served a population of about 130,000, I think he said, 
And they found a 40% reduction in the use of antipsychotic medication during their eight months, which has then been maintained. And also um, their data indicate there has not been as an increase in the use of other means of coercion. But there is contrary evidence from a, another study in uh, Baden, I uh, can't remember what, Württemberg, I think, in which there was an increase during that period in the number of uh, seclusions and restraints. So that's not entirely clear. National policies, Netherlands had a large policy, uh, still continues to reduce seclusion. And there was a 99% reduction per annum. So those uh, hospitals who started early in 2008 to 2013 had a 41% reduction. In Gujarat, India, which, which is a low income country, the World Health Organization quality rights implementation. So this is a human rights supporting uh, set of standards that um, the mental health uh, authorities in Gujarat, India, agreed to uh, develop or, or to move towards those standards showed some you know, uh, significant but modest gains. But we're talking about a low income country and we're talking about a fairly short period. The strongest evidence uh, comes in two areas, I think. You'll see the host hospital-based changes in practice, six core strategies, safe wards, reducing restrictive practices, um, which is college-based, uh, Royal College-based, uh, and an earlier report from the Care Quality Commission 2017 shows actually that, I mean, for example, you take reducing restrictive practices, 38 wards, 15% reduction in 18 months, and 17 wards averaged over 60% reduction in the use of restrictive practices, seclusion or restrictions. Uh, strain study of safe wards, 36% reduction. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that if the intention is there, if there's a top-down will to do it, if there's a bottom-up uh, will on the part of the mental health professionals working in collaboration with service users, terribly important, um, that one can re significantly reduce the number of restrictive uh, practices. Germany, a very large study involving 21 psychiatric hospitals over 15 years showed that an, uh, comparing open wards, open door wards with closed wards showed no increase in suicide attempts, suicide or absconding. In fact, on the open door wards, there were fewer suicide attempts and absconding and less restraints. Um, so uh, suicides, there was no difference in the number of uh, completed suicides. So I think pretty strong evidence of hospital-based practices uh, that can re significantly reduce uh, seclusion restraint. And then community-based strategies are very good evidence that advanced statements or joint crisis plans or advanced directives uh, in a meta-analysis found a 23% reduction in involuntary admissions. That's uh, useful. Um, crisis residential services, more anecdotal. Um, and so uh, patients are certainly very keen on, on, on those and say that they are just as, as uh, more, more helpful than acute admission wards. So you can see there that there are clear, there's clear evidence, despite the meager amount of research, for changes in practice that significantly reduce recourse to coercion. So at the moment, we are now in a period where there is a strong international movement amongst organizations, a number of bodies that have a concern with Human Rights, the United Nations especially, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has been a very powerful influence. Now, it, the committee that oversees that convention go to the position 
of saying that all substitute decision making must be eliminated and of course all involuntary treatment interventions are substitute decisions not with the consent of, of the patient but other united nations bodies including the human rights committee human rights council a number of special rapporteurs don't go so far but all of them emphasize the need that to respect the will and preferences of a person with a disability. I unfortunately don't have the time to go into will and preferences and how I think this relates to decision-making capacity and uh, best interests, but I'll come to a reference later on if you're interested. World Psychiatric Association has come out with a position statement uh, in which um, it, it is saying that it, we need now to implement alternatives to coercion. They've created a uh, international task force to, to deal with this. Uh, I'm a member of that, so I'm familiar with what they're doing. Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly in, I think it was 2019, said, passed a resolution of ending coercion in mental health, the need for a human rights-based approach. So that Council of Europe is supporting this. I've mentioned the World Health Organization Quality Rights Program. The Lancet Commission on the Future of Psychiatry has also um, alerted to, uh, us to the overuse of coercion and uh, arguing for a human rights-based approach. And even locally in England and Wales, the white paper reform from the Mental Health Act is saying we must reduce involuntary admissions, the CQC is arguing the same, and uh, the code of practice for the Mental Health Act, uh, for the Eng England and Wales Mental Health Act 2015, is also uh, pointing in various areas to a reduction of coercion. So this is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to support the view of the Special Committee on Human Rights that human rights and mental health now looms large and now is the time for a concerted effort to minimize coercion in mental health care and that the Royal College of Psychiatrists should support alternatives to coercion position of the WPA and support interventions and research into reducing coercion. So have I got, I think I've got a minute or so. So um, to conclude, coercion can be pretty clearly defined. Um, if we're going to uh, monitor coercion, I think we need to probably focus on the more objective measures, involuntary detention, involuntary treatment, seclusion, restraints, uh, maybe emergency forced uh, medication. But this could be supplemented with perceived coercion assessments, uh, a, a, a number of which are now fairly well uh, standardized in, in their psychometric properties. We need a principled approach to the use of coercion in mental health care and um, I would argue the capacity best interest scheme is the best model and that can be applied across the whole range of treatment pressures I would argue. The huge variations in the recourse to coercion in mental health care, national, international, local, indicate an overwhelming role, I would suggest, of unacceptable arbitrariness in its use, and arbitrariness is anathema to law. There are a number of promising alternatives that uh, need further development and evaluation, and now is the right time for changes uh, in the use of coercion and an attempt to eliminate the shadow of coercion that plagues psychiatry. And there's a reference there in which all of these elements are uh, dealt with in, in, in detail. Uh, it's, uh, it's a book, um, but uh, I'm not trying to sell it. You'll probably get it through your library uh, if, for those who are interested in, in looking at this in, in more detail. So I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was really thought provoking. Um, and in my experience, unfortunately, coercion is something that is not given nearly enough consideration. So it's nice to take a bit of time um, to think through it.